to our service this morning in the nice, cold, snowy weather. Hope everybody made it okay. Didn't look like the roads were too bad. So once again this week, we gather in the presence of God to worship Him together. And before we start that, I just want to read a few announcements um, that you'll find in your bulletin. I mentioned last week that we're starting a new uh, grief share ministry on March 18th, that's a Monday, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., and that's continuing for several weeks. And this is a group uh, for anyone that has recently lost someone close to them and you would like to kind of walk through the grief process, um, this class is for you. So if you're interested in that, please uh, contact Teresa Ingram for further information. Again, that's starting Monday, March 18th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. here at the church. Um, we also have a new Sunday school start time beginning next Sunday. We're going to move it forward 15 minutes from 9 to 9.15. So keep that in mind if you're attending Sunday school. It will start at 9.15 next week. And by the way, as everybody I'm sure is aware, daylight saving time starts next weekend as well. So don't forget to shift your clocks forward. One of these days we're going to stop doing that, I hope. Uh, Women's Missionary Fellowship will meet on March 12th at 10 a.m. And Randy Gleason will be our guest speaker there. And he will be speaking at 11 a.m. For those of you that would just like to come here, Randy. But otherwise, join the Women's Missionary Fellowship on the 12th at 10 over in the Fellowship Hall. And then again, uh, as we mentioned last week, we will be having some baptisms in the spring. So contact Pastor Adam or one of the elders if you're interested in becoming baptized. So let us turn now to the worship of our Lord. And our passage this morning comes from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands I sing for joy. Let's pray. Father, we do indeed sing for joy at the work of your hands. And as we look out over your creation and the work there that you've done and the work that you do in our hearts and minds, we gather here this morning and give you thanks and praise. And so as, you, as we worship you this morning, Lord, would you move aside all distractions and let us be focused on your very presence for you are in fact meeting us here this morning. We ask these things in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. your name. 
Catechism this morning comes from uh, Galatians 2.20, and the question is, what is faith in Jesus Christ? Seems like a simple question, but we'll see that there's more depth to that, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a more difficult question to answer. But Galatians 2.20 brings uh, an answer, and it rings like this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So if you'll read the answer with me together. Faith in Jesus Christ is acknowledging the truth of everything that God has revealed in his word, trusting in him and also receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Let's pray. Jesus, author of our faith, we believe that you are who you say you are. Your word is truth and it reveals you as our only hope of salvation. We believe your promises, walking by faith and not by sight. Amen. stand and continue singing together.
merciful, he is the God who saves.
Good morning, FBC. How's everybody doing this morning? We've got a few people out with colds, and I think some people were a little worried to drive in the snow, but uh, we'll get there this morning. So welcome if you're new with us. My name is Adam, and I'm the teaching pastor here. And this morning, we're going to be going through John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. Look at that. It's only taken us three weeks to get through one chapter. So uh, a couple of things today. Today is Communion Sunday, and we're going to partake of that together uh, towards the end of the service. And uh, a reminder that, uh, you know, next week, spring your clocks ahead. And if I'm not here, it means that I forgot. Uh, but also, on Communion Sundays, we do put out our Deacon Fund offering, and the funds that you offer to that, they go to helping uh, people of our church and people in our community who would not otherwise have the means necessary to do something like uh, the electric bill or a car repair. Yeah, it's people in kind of desperate situations, and, and we do have that Deacon Fund to help, and we also have our regular offering fund out, so as God leads you, feel free to give. Um, but uh, I'm going to read the scripture here, then we're going to pray, then we're going to jump into the message. So, verse 35, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and as he walked by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we are so thankful for your word. Lord, we are thankful that we get to see Jesus. Lord, that we get to know Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, we are thankful that Jesus did it willingly. Lord, as we come to you this morning and as we hear your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work in our hearts, that you would conform us into the image of Jesus, Lord, that you would help us to be more like you. Lord, I pray for anybody here this morning that has not put faith in Jesus, that your spirit would move in them and today would be the day. Lord, we pray that it would be your words, not my own, but that you would be glorified through your message this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got, I got a weird question for you. Anyone ever uh, seen a TV commercial? Really, nobody's going to raise their hand on that one? Right, who, who hasn't seen a TV commercial? And, I, and I've got to be honest, since Teresa and I have been married, we've never paid for cable. Really, uh, the only time we watch cable TV is staying at a hotel. But with streaming services, I thought, sweet, no commercials. So we've gotten a few of these streaming services, and in the last few months, all of a sudden, they have commercials again. So in the, in the golden age of technology, they have figured out how to once again force me to watch commercials. 
And maybe I'm impatient, but who wants commercials unless you're at the movie theater seeing upcoming previews? Those are the commercials I really like. I want to go see that movie. But there's a specific type of commercial that I find kind of funny, and it's medication commercials. Right? They, they start by showing people doing wildly active things like paragliding in the Caribbean, but somehow it's, it's messed up and they aren't having fun. And then all of a sudden they're, they're driving a minivan, rushing their kids to school, and, and everything seems wrong. The kids aren't behaving and they're having a horrible day. And then it shows them laying in bed next to their, their spouse, but somehow it looks uncomfortable, like they're frowning. And then the narrator says, do you suffer from shingles? And I just know everyone out in TV land is like, maybe? Well, then you should talk to your doctor about 12 a day, the newly formulated medication that will relieve all symptoms you have ever had. Small side effects may include runny eyeballs, sweaty toenails, occasional stomach tightness, uh, low-grade fever, and death. And if you've ever had left molar cavities, 12 a day is not right for you. Talk to your doctor and see if 12 a day is right for you. And then it goes back to showing them paragliding, but somehow it's better. Like they're, they're now suddenly able to paraglide through levitating flaming hoops, right? Now, there's no issues. Suddenly, they're, they're no longer rushing their kids to school in a minivan. It's now a luxury Lexus SUV, and everything is like super chill and not rushed. Right? And then finally, it shows them sleeping next to their spouse with a big toothy smile like everything is perfect. Okay, and I know I have wildly exaggerated this, right? But that's what pastors do. We're fishers of men, and, and fishermen, we always exaggerate, right? The fish is always this big. But, but we do know these types of commercials. And what is the point of these types of commercials? Well, they want, they want you to take their medication, right? Right? Big Pharmacy is calling you to take their medication, and they're using TV commercials to make that call known. And although I'm not a fan of these commercials, they do have something in common with the gospel. Like the, the companies that are calling you to take their medication, God is calling you to have a relationship with him. And for many of us, we might actually benefit from some of these medications depending on the circumstances of our lives, but all whom God calls benefit from God's calling if they put faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. The relief of symptoms in God's kingdom is eternity in the presence of God without the brokenness of sin anymore. Now that being said, I'm not encouraging you to get on any medications you see on TV. You should check with your doctor to see if 12 a day is right for you. And 12 a day is a fictional medication I made up in which you have to take it 12 times a day. It's every two hours. What I am telling you, though, is God is calling you and he wants a relationship with you and he loves you. And he has done all the work in order for you to follow him. So let me give you a little bit of context about where we're at in John here. We're still in chapter one of the Gospel of John. And we must remember that the, whenever the writer of the Gospel of John pins the name John in this book, he is talking about someone else. He is not talking about himself. He has been talking a lot about John the Baptist, who is the forerunner to the Messiah. John the Baptist's job, his job has been to point people to Jesus so that they can respond appropriately to Jesus. Now the first verse, the first verses of the book of John talk about Jesus' deity, and then last week, we talked about John's ministry, and we discovered that John's job was pointing people to Jesus. And what we're seeing now in the scripture is the decrease of John the Baptist and the increase of Jesus, as people are now starting to look at Jesus. So we're seeing a decrease of John's ministry as we see the increase of Jesus' ministry, which was the plan all along. Last week, we saw that followers of Jesus point to Jesus. We saw John do that, right? Followers of Jesus, they practice humility. And followers of Jesus know Jesus. And we're seeing this played out here in the scripture today as John, in his humility, is submitting to Christ's ministerial increase. 
as his own ministry decreases. And the the very reason that this is happening is because John is pointing to Jesus, not himself. And in fact, we're seeing some of John's own disciples leave John as they start to become disciples of Jesus. And they're going to get to know Jesus. And they're going to do this, and then they're going to call others to Jesus out of their own humility, knowing that they're not the answer, but Jesus is. And today we're going to see that Jesus is intentional about calling his disciples. And then that, in effect, makes his disciples intentional about calling disciples to Jesus. But everyone who, is followed, everyone who follows Jesus is called by Jesus, even when it is a follower of Jesus who walks a disciple to Jesus. Which is why my big idea this morning is that Jesus calls his followers. Jesus calls his followers. So if we look at the whole Bible, we see God call people all over it, whether it's the calling of Noah to build an ark or the the calling of Abraham into uh, becoming a covenant people that's in relationship to God. God calls prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. He calls kings like David. And then in the New Testament, we see Jesus call his disciples. We see Jesus call Paul directly Out of persecuting the church, we can read about that in the book of Acts. God calls the people he wants in his kingdom. So let's listen to what Peter says on the day of Pentecost. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord, our God, calls to himself. Peter says this this gift of salvation is to everyone whom God calls to himself. There There is no doubt in Scripture that God is in charge. He is sovereign and he is calling people to himself. But Peter also says, repent and be baptized, which implies that there is, there is a personal responsibility. Repent, we know, means turn relationally to the Lord. It's the Hebrew word shove, which means to turn towards. So there, there's a tension here. God calls people to himself, and we know from other parts of Scripture that this calling exists before creation was created. But there's also personal responsibility in this calling. And, and there are a lot of opinions on what this means. For some, they're on different sides of camps, right? We have people who believe that it is only personal responsibility. And we have people that it is only, they believe that it is only God calling people. But the answer is yes. God is so powerful that people can both have personal responsibility and the choice to follow God and be predestined and be called before they were ever born and even have an opportunity to make the choice. And I don't know how to explain that. I don't think we can explain it, except for you can't explain what a three-dimensional world is like to a two-dimensional world. You can't go to a cartoon character and tell them what depth is like. They have no point of reference for that. But the point is, though, that Jesus calls us. We see it in the gospel. We see it throughout Scripture. We know that God calls every believer. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, you have a special calling. You are called to be his forever. And he even gives us the responsibility to participate in his calling of others to his kingdom. But here's the crazy part about it. Let me read you a couple of verses here. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to, make, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that 
as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And as we're going to find, as we'll find out later in the book of 1 Corinthians, God's power is perfected in weakness. And you know what this means? This means that God chooses the unlikely, which is why my first point is God chooses the unlikely. He calls the unlikely. Jesus chooses the unlikely. Jesus isn't looking for people to do the work in their own strength. He is looking for people who are dependent on him. Because this isn't about our glory. This is about the glory of God. So he chooses weak people in whom he does amazing things through. He chooses people so that other people see God, not the, peop- not the person participating in what God is doing. Because that's what it's about. Our need for God to take care of our spiritual rot. This isn't about personality cults. It's not about being strong. It's about God's kingdom. And in God's kingdom, God gets the glory. And our king is Jesus. So Jesus gets the glory. So let's get into the passage here this morning. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Again, John is pointing to Jesus. He's pointing Jesus out to his very own disciples and the whole crowd. Because followers of Jesus... We learned last week, they point to Jesus, and that's what John is doing right now. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So we can already see how this is the decrease of John the Baptist's ministry. Even John's disciples recognize that John is saying Jesus is more important than John is. And in John saying this, he is helping people to see that they ought to respond appropriately to the Messiah, that That's what's going on here. Jesus is the most important thing. Respond to him. And these disciples who leave John and they go to follow Jesus, they're beginning to form their response to Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following following him, and he said to them, what are you seeking? Jesus, he wants them to verbalize what is in their hearts. He already knows, but he's wanting them to verbalize it, so he asks them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, and in fact, it quite literally means great one, where are you staying? And this word staying, it's actually the word abiding. And this question, to ask somebody where they're abiding, is saying, I want to get to know you better. So it implies that, hey, we want want to follow you. We want to get to know you. Where are you abiding? We want to see what that's like. So he says to them, come and you will see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour, which is probably about 4 p.m. And they're seeing this person who John the Baptist has pointed out as the Christ, the Messiah. And what they're finding out about this Messiah is probably that he's living in really humble conditions. They're not seeing what you would expect of a king, a king who's going to reign forever. And one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. These two disciples, one of them is Andrew, which is Peter's brother, and the other is John, James's brother, and John is actually the writer of this very book, the Gospel of John. And John, the writer of the Gospel, in keeping with what we learned about followers of Jesus practicing humility, He's doing this by not all through the book going, look at me, look at me, it was me, Jesus called me, 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 me. No, John, the writer of this gospel, just as John the Baptist is doing, is trying to intentionally point to people, point people to Jesus and not himself, which is what we ought to be doing in our personal lives. We want people to see Jesus' glory, not our own. But Andrew was the brother of Simon, who Jesus is going to rename Peter. And Andrew is so excited that they have found the Messiah, one of the first things he does is he goes and he grabs someone he cares about, and that's Peter. Listen, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which which means Christ. We brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Cephas is uh, the Aramaic. Okay? And it means stone. And translated to Greek, it is Peter, which means stone. 
and is speaking to the fact that Peter will be foundational to, not the foundation, but foundational to the formation of the early church. See, when Jesus calls you, it is in him that we actually find our true identity. And Peter's actually going to mess up a whole lot of things during Jesus' ministry. We, we know this since we've just gone through the whole book of Matthew, right? Peter, at times, denies Jesus. Peter, at times, resorts to violence. Peter is often so stubborn. And, and in fact, we, we see the time on the Mount of Transfiguration when God the Father has to straight up interrupt Peter. Peter, Peter wow. Straight up interrupt Peter to get him to shut up. He wouldn't shut up. But Jesus, when, when he calls people, he works in them over time to conform them into his own image. And, and looking at the life of Peter, we see that was, is what God is doing. But not only that, he's calling unlikely people. Because look at all the weird, stupid things Peter did. God calls unlikely people because he's not looking for the people who are going to get everything right on the outside. He's looking for people who have to be dependent on him. Which, spoiler alert, is everyone, but not everyone recognizes their need to be completely dependent on God. And this part here in John, this, this is the men really starting to get to know Jesus. Their, their true calling is going to come sometime later. Or I guess maybe I should say the fulfillment of their calling is going to come later. Because between the Gospel of John and the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke... There was something that happened as these men were getting to know Jesus. There was something that needed to happen first. So Jesus right now is building a relationship with these men, and they absolutely know who he is. But Jesus hasn't at this point been tempted by Satan yet. And from the other Gospels, we know that before Jesus started his public ministry, he would be tempted by Satan. He would prove himself able to defeat sin, to, com to continue to be righteousness, even though there's this temptation of the devil. And after the temptation, that is when Jesus calls his disciples to fulfill their calling, as Jesus is going to then start his public ministry. So I, I want to explain something here. John wrote his gospel after the other three synoptic gospels were written, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they actually, they probably shared the same source because they have so much in common, now, almost verbatim many times. And that source in, in the theological community is called the Q source. And it's actually theorized that that source of information, yes, some of it came from the writers because they had personal experiences with Jesus, but most or a huge chunk of that information that's all very similar in those three Gospels, came from Mary, the mother of Jesus. But after those three Gospels were written, John was asked to write the Gospel by the early church because of his direct relationship with Jesus. They wanted him to write it from his perspective because he knew things about Jesus that were not in the other three Gospels. So John shows us, through this initial meeting of the disciples, where they stay the day with Jesus as they're being called, he shows us that Jesus is calling them through relationship. But let's take a look at the book of Matthew real quick. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and their father and followed him. These two stories about how Jesus called James and John and Andrew and Peter, they almost sound conflicting, but the two stories actually corroborate each other. In that we see that Simon is already called Peter at this point, which means he has already had that name change, which tells us that John tells us when that happened, right? 
And when Jesus says, follow me, they immediately do. They immediately leave their livelihood to go be with Jesus. Why would you leave your livelihood immediately because of someone you know nothing about? You wouldn't, right? I mean, even when people get saved, their lives don't usually change overnight. But it's the more we get to know Jesus, the more we start to fulfill our calling. So yes, here in John, Jesus is calling these men through relationship But we're going to see the fulfillment of their calling as their relationship with Jesus develops. And that's what we hear about in Matthew. And following Jesus means submitting everything to him. And we're not very good at it. I I fail at it all the time. We still struggle with sin, right? And we all will until we're called home. But we see an example here in both John and Matthew John and Andrew leave John the Baptist to be followers of Jesus. They leave what is already a known quantity in the hope of something better. And then they start to submit everything to Jesus. They start bringing people to Jesus. In Matthew, we see them willingly leave their livelihood, their means of providing for themselves, because they want to submit to Jesus. They immediately follow him. And we see this in our own lives when we put faith in Jesus. The more and more we get to know him, the more and more we follow him, means the more and more we submit to him. Or at least that's the way it ought to be. I know some of us are stubborn and hard-headed, but still, over time, God is going to work on us so that we submit to him more and more. But it takes Jesus' calling in our lives for that to happen. And the beautiful thing about this calling is this calling first comes in the form of relationship. We get to know him. We get to understand his grace for our lives. What it is that he has done for us in sacrificing everything for us out of his love for us. That's where the calling begins. And there's actually a book. It's called Courage and Calling. And if you've not read it, I would encourage you to do so. It points out that that God has really three types of callings for our lives. One is to the call to come to relationship with Jesus. Two is the call to make disciples. It's how we do ministry for God's kingdom. For some of us, it may be a vocation. And for others of us, it's through relationships that we make in our jobs, with our families, and with our friends, and in our communities. And the the, the third calling is is called immediate callings. And it's so-and-so needs help with the whatchamacallit. Or this person in front of me needs right now. They're in need and I've got to do something about it. But those last two callings, the calling to make disciples and those immediate callings, the calling to help and to serve, those last two callings each have the foundation of coming to saving faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins through relationship with Jesus. So Jesus calls us. We see it here, and it starts with relationship. But this point is not just focused on the fact that Jesus calls us, right? This this point is uh, that he calls the unlikely. So we know that Andrew and Peter and James and John were fishermen. And if any of you ever worked on a professional fishing vessel, I'm not seeing any hands raised. How many of you have seen the show Deadliest Catch? Okay, now we got some hands raising. Fishermen today, and even in biblical times, have had a certain reputation to uphold. They're kind of rough dudes. They don't always have the nicest language. And part of that is because death is always looming. You never know what's going to happen at sea. Sometimes people fall in. Storms happen. Sickness. Food gets weird out on sea. And there's always this amazing pressure to get that big catch so that money comes in and you can provide for yourself and your family. These men, today fishermen, are rough around the edges. And these four dudes are not what you would call nice synagogue boys. But God called them anyway. And if we look at the rest of the Gospels, we can actually see who else Jesus calls, right? He calls Simon the Zealot, who at one point had probably resorted to extreme violence against Rome, or at least he had had the intention to, being called a zealot and all. We have Matthew, a tax collector, who was considered a traitor to Israel. 
Mary Magdalene, who had been a prostitute and possessed by demons. This was ragtag, rough and tumble group there as there ever was. And we see Jesus calls them to follow him. And he transforms them through relationship so I lost my place. So that they can fulfill what he is calling them to do for his kingdom. All this to say, for us who are already believers in Jesus, God is working in us, and in his power, or his power is being perfected in our weaknesses, the areas of lives where we don't measure up. And by way of application, what this means is that we can never write anyone off as unsavable. We can't look at a person, their circumstances, or even the horrible things they've done and say, well, God is unable to do a work there. Or, yeah, they're never going to get it. It actually gives us more reason to pray for them and ask God to do his awesome work in their lives. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of our New Testament, and he was extremely effective at planting churches in areas that have never even heard of Jesus. Yet when God called him, he was on his way to persecute the church. There are literally dead Christians martyred because of the actions of Paul. Because of who he was before Jesus called him into relationship and then equipped him to fulfill that calling. Nothing is impossible for God. So when you see the unlikely to become Christians, pray for them. Because God calls the unlikely, just like he did with these fishermen and just like he did with us. All right. What have we learned so far? We've, we've learned... That Jesus calls us. He calls us into relationship with himself. We can't get there on our own, in our own strength. We have learned that Jesus, he even calls the unlikely. People who it doesn't make sense that they would give their lives to Christ. And that's us. We are the unlikely. I mean, come on. Before I got saved, when I was in ninth grade, I was the gothic kid that was into witchcraft. I painted my fingernails black. Okay? Okay? And it's actually funny, one of our youth students heard this during youth group, and they thought that I was saying I was gothic as an adult. So I played along, and I was like, yeah, 30 was a really rough year for me. But the point is, somehow, by the grace of God, I ended up in a youth group, and those youth leaders didn't give up on me, even though I was an unlikely convert. And now God has equipped this young, unlikely kid from a very broken home life to fulfill the calling that God had for me, which is here at FBC Ashland. We can't write people off. But what does God's calling look like, right? We each have a calling that God has equipped us for. Let's think of it this way. How many of you have ever been involved in a pyramid scheme? I did not think I was going to get any raised hands. That's funny. I was going to say, no raised hands. Of course not. No one would admit to that. But thank you, Scott. All right. I, 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 I'm going to explain this here, and I promise it's not heresy once you hear me explain it. But, but the idea of a pyramid scheme here is there is someone at the top, and typically they're selling some sort of product to someone else. And those people that buy that product from the person on top, they then go and sell their products to people below them. All the while, commissions are flowing upwards. And the higher you are up on the pyramid, the more commissions you get. All right, so those people who get into these schemes, they're excited about the earning potential as long as they sell the product. So what do they do? They literally tell everyone they know about what they're doing. And many of us have had that friend, and some of us, like Scott, have been that friend who is telling everybody. And in fact, we're now throwing parties to try to move product, and we're having barbecues, and people come over under the false pretenses that it's just a get-together, and then all of a sudden you're displaying whatever it is this product is. And the intention is telling everyone they know about, or everyone they know about this product so they can sell it and get their commissions. And what I want to focus on is not so much the illegal activity. I did check it. It is illegal uh, by state laws and federal laws. 
I'm not focused on that. And I'm not focused on the shrewd ways in which people try to sell their stuff. But there's an excitement, right? And they're sharing and they're recruiting, right? And, and you see, even though I don't think a pyramid scheme is a good business model, and if you disagree, go ahead and email Lee Fox at AOL.com. I do think that we ought to be even more excited. We should be sharing the gospel even more. And, and because of what we're telling people, it's not a way to earn commissions. It's a way to, to see others be given eternal life. And yeah, there are rewards, but the biggest reward, the one that should be on top of the pyramid by worldly standards, is the reward for all of us who follow Jesus, not just the people at top. It's the reward of being in the presence of God, the presence of Jesus for all eternity. So just like people in a pyramid business model are recruiting people, followers of Jesus call other followers. That's why my second point is, followers call other followers. I'm, I'm, I'm going to preface it with this. Yes, we are to call other followers in the sense of making disciples and evangelizing. But it still takes God through the work of the Holy Spirit to call each individual. It's that we get to participate in his calling of others, right? It's like the military calls people. Recruiters get to participate in that calling by doing the job of recruiting. But if a particular recruiter quits, the military doesn't stop recruiting people. So though it is God's deal to call people, we have the responsibility to participate in God's calling by telling people about Jesus, by making disciples, by evangelizing and discipling. That is why we tell people the truth about Jesus through the truth of his word and the truth of what God is doing in our lives. And then when they accept that calling, when they put faith in Jesus, when they decide they want that relationship, we then walk that Christian life with them. We disciple them. And what we're going to see here, those two disciples who left John the Baptist, Andrew and John, we just, right, we, we're going to see them go to their brothers, right? And Andrew got Peter, and John went and got James. And now we're about to see Jesus call another disciple named Philip. And Philip is going to turn around and call Nathaniel. And then God, through Jesus, is going to work on Nathaniel and call him to confirm that calling. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. All right, Jesus is headed towards Galilee. It's really closer to his home turf. And that's where he's going to base most of his ministry, his earthly ministry. And he finds Philip. And he tells Philip, follow me. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. All right, here's what we know about Philip, being that it is mentioned that Philip is from Bethsaida and that it, that's also the city of Andrew and Peter. John is alluding to us that there is a pre-relationship that Philip has with Andrew and Peter. And we just saw Jesus' relational calling of Andrew and Peter, so it's likely Philip had some sort of relationship with Andrew and Peter. He actually may have worked with Andrew, Peter, James, and John as a fisherman. So even in the background here, we're seeing that relationship in, in that people are participating in God's calling of other people. In fact, Andrew and Peter, at the very least, most likely had a previous relationship with Philip because when we see Jesus seek out Philip, Philip trusts Jesus enough to just follow him, which for him to not know anything about this would be actually very uncharacteristic of Philip because of what we see him do later in the gospel. Philip is very, very pragmatic, and that often gets in the way of him believing that Jesus can do something like feed thousands of people or even uh, associate with Greek people when they want to meet Jesus. So something about the followers of Jesus made Philip comfortable with following Jesus. And so we can think about this in our own terms, um, in cultural terms. People in general are pretty untrusting of people that they do not already have a relationship, right? We, we don't trust the new guy at work until we build a relationship with him. We don't trust the boss, the new boss, until a relationship has been built. 
And Andrew and Peter had that kind of trust from Philip because he knew through his relationship with Andrew and, and Peter that it was okay to follow Jesus since they were following Jesus. And, and that's how we ought to be as followers of Jesus. Part of our participating in the calling of other followers to Jesus is actually to build relationships with unbelievers so that they can see we are trustworthy, so that they can see Jesus living in us. We're supposed to be a light to the world, right? If they don't know us, if they don't know what makes us tick, if they don't know that we have Jesus, how are we being a light for Jesus? I'll tell you a small story. You guys have heard parts of it, I think. But back in 2012, I was, I was in Afghanistan, and I had a best friend on that deployment who was a fellow Navy corpsman. So we stuck together pretty good as we, we bonded over uh, being with Marines but not being Marines. It's kind of a weird paradox. But my friend, he, he pretty much knew everything about me. He knew my strengths, he knew my weaknesses, and he knew that I was a follower of Jesus. He knew that he could tell me what he was struggling with, and even though I might tell him the, the truth about right and wrong, he knew that those things he struggled with didn't actually affect our relationship. But at the time, I was too chicken to really directly tell him the gospel of Jesus. And one day, he stepped on an explosive device. It should have killed him, but miraculously, it did not. So when he, get, he, got, when he got back from the hospital from getting checked out, I realized the reality of death was so prominent here in Afghanistan that it would be better to lose a friend trying to win a soul for God's kingdom than lose a friend for eternity. So I sat him down, I explained the gospel to him, and I was nervous I was gonna lose a friend. And, and full transparency, we were in a combat zone, and out of nervousness, I had taken up smoking at that time, and, <clears throat> and he was a two-pack-a-day smoker. Now, I don't recommend cigarette evangelizing but at the time, it was something I struggled with, and he knew that I viewed it as a struggle because I was like, man, I got to quit before I got home. I get home. Yeah, my wife's laughing because it took me six years to quit. But it, it, a few days after I talked to him about it, eventually he came to me and he said, hey, I just thought you should know I've been seriously thinking about what you said about Jesus. And because I know you, you're not just this guy that pretends to be some sort of goody two-shoe all the time. You're real, and you have real struggles. I prayed. He goes, I prayed, and I think that God kept me alive for a reason, because I really shouldn't be. So I did. I put faith in Jesus. And now I know he's going to forgive me like he's forgiven you. I didn't end up losing a friend, but I ended up gaining a brother in Christ. And to this day, him and I both still have our struggles with sin. We all do. But he's still walking with Jesus. And like I said, it did take me six years, uh, but God eventually gave me victory over at least the habit of smoking. But I still have my flaws, just as we all do. And when we're building relationships with unbelievers, often it is them seeing that we are real people who have struggles just like them that actually gives them hope in Jesus, in the same Jesus we follow. And then they actually begin to answer that relational call. And we get to watch as God equips them to fulfill the calling he has on their life for how they're going to affect God's kingdom. But let's get back to Philip. What does he do after he follows Jesus? Well, Philip went and found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip goes to someone he has a relationship with and he tells them about Jesus. He goes to Nathaniel and says, hey, we found the guy, we found the Messiah. And when Philip calls him the son of Joseph, he's not saying that the virgin birth did not happen. But people didn't have last names at the time, so they were specifically identified by where they were from and who was their father. And Joseph had adopted Jesus. And in the Hebrew culture, adoption Meant, was that, meant that that's who you identified by. That's your father. In fact, ad, in fact, adopted children, you couldn't even banish from your family. You could do that with sons that your wife gave birth to, but not one you adopted. Adoption was so strong that even your adopted father's lineage would be considered your own. So Jesus was still in David's lineage through Joseph, even though Joseph was not his biological father. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Nathaniel is brutally honest at this point. The area of Galilee was looked down upon by those from Jerusalem. And Nazareth in the area of Galilee was looked down upon by those who uh, lived in Galilee. So think of it this way. There are a lot of people in Portland who look down on on southern Oregon, in particular Medford. In fact, Medford has a nickname. It's Methford. All right? But then I get to hear people in Medford who think that White City is just the worst. So this, Nathaniel, he is saying, can anything really come out, uh, anything good come out of White City? Right? That's what he's saying. These are cultural biases. Certain areas of lesser status were looked down upon, just like today. And Philip is telling Nathaniel, is really the Messiah, uh, or no, Philip is telling Nathaniel that the Messiah is coming from the lowest of low areas status-wise. So of course Nathaniel has a hard time believing that the rescuer sent by God, God himself in the flesh, is going to come from such low status. But it actually sounds to me like God choosing unlikely stuff. Maybe his, his power being perfected in weakness. Choosing the lowly and despised of the world to bring from nothing things that are. Philip doesn't argue with Nathaniel here. He doesn't say, oh no, dude, let me prove to you how good things can come out of Nazareth. Philip simply says, come and see. And it's a good lesson for us in evangelizing. He doesn't argue, he just says, come and see. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a time and place for apologetics and defending the truth of the gospel, but often we can tell people what we know to be true about Jesus without arguing. We can do it by continuing to let them see Jesus in us as we build relationship with them. We can just simply invite them to church, say, come and see. We don't always have to argue a person into the gospel. Sometimes it is simply telling them what Jesus has done in our lives and then living lives, living those lives as Jesus calls us to, which will in turn build trust into those relationships we have with unbelievers. Because when we do that, God does some pretty amazing work in those people who are unlikely to come to the gospel. So listen to what Jesus does now. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite, Indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And this word deceit is also the word guile. And it's very connected to Jacob from the Old Testament. And we know from reading the Old Testament, Jacob was deceitful. He tricked his, his brother out of his birthright, tricked his father to give him the blessing reserved for the oldest son. And the idea here is that there is deceit everywhere in Israel, but Jesus knows Nathaniel, and supernaturally he knows that this is a man who is not deceitful. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. It's going to blow your minds. And Jesus tells Nathanael what he was doing before Philip went and called him. And he says, I saw you under the fig tree. And under the fig tree was symbolic of God doing his thing. It's actually an idiom that represents God's wisdom and knowledge. And it became another idiom to mean someone who is faithfully waiting on the Messiah. So it's actually likely that when Philip found Nathaniel, he was studying God's word, meditating on it, and thinking of the future day when God would provide his Messiah. This wasn't just a place under a tree in the shade. Although he may have literally been under a tree in the shade, because of these several idioms that were used that are associated with under the fig tree, people would often meditate on scripture under fig trees. But Jesus is saying something so much more than you were under a tree over there. Jesus is saying, I know your heart, Nathaniel. I know your desires. You are looking for the Messiah, and here I am. That's why Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel, whom Philip brought to Jesus. Then Jesus does a work, and Nathaniel responds in relational faith. He says, teacher, you are the son of God, which means equality to God. And he says, you are the king of Israel. And we must remember this promised king through the line of David, this, this king would be a Messiah, the Messiah. 
and to his kingdom there would be no end. And Nathanael is seeing that Jesus is this Messiah because, yes, God revealed this to him, but it was through Philip's participation in bringing him to Jesus. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than these. Jesus is affirming Nathanael. You believe of this small thing because of the small thing? Buckle up, because you're going to see much greater than this. And then he goes on to say, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, Nathanael has been brought to Jesus by Philip. And in the beginning of his conversation with Nathanael, Jesus said there is no deceit in Nathanael, the word deceit or guile. And we know that Jesus used the idiom under the fig tree so we can deduct that it was likely that Nathanael was studying God's word. And in doing so, he had an anticipation, a desire for the coming Messiah. It may very well have been that Nathanael was studying the story of Jacob, who we know was deceitful or had guile. And then Jesus closes this part of the conversation with, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And this is an allusion back to the story of Jacob. When Jacob was running away from his brother because of the deceit that he had pulled on his brother and his father, Jacob during that time had a a famous dream that we call Jacob's Ladder. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, And he came to a certain place and stayed there at night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give you and to your offspring. This dream was a comfort to Jacob, letting him know that God was with him and protecting him. But it is also something more. Because what Jesus is saying to Nathanael and alluding to this dream is that Jesus is the ladder. Heaven is opened up and at the bottom and and at the bottom of this ladder, which by the way, ladder is really poor translation, it should be stairway. Jesus is there. Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is God's protection for those who put faith in Jesus because he is protecting our souls for eternity through his own righteousness, through the works that we do getting, uh, I'm sorry, he's protecting us by his own righteousness. And it's not like the Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven, where they do works to get us to heaven. Jesus has done all the work, and he is the path to heaven if we put faith in Jesus. If we put faith in Jesus, we're on that path to heaven. Jesus is telling Nathaniel, I am the stairway to heaven. To get you to the Father, you come through me. It isn't some laborious thing we can accomplish to be saved. It is simply by putting faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So so by way of application, we recognize that Jesus is the one who calls us But that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility in participating in the calling of others to Jesus. In fact, God often communicates to us through what people are doing to participate in God's kingdom. Sometimes some of you have come up to me and said, oh man, great sermon, which I think they're all terrible, so I'm glad you guys think they're great. But you say, great sermon, that has helped me to recognize what God is doing in my life what he's calling me to. It's, it convicted me of this thing that I don't think is actually right. God uses us to communicate his word to others. And he's called us to evangelize and to make disciples. So God is using each one of us as a witness to him for the sake of people who do not yet know Jesus. We get to go call people to Jesus as vessels of his communication. He's using us like walkie-talkies. The communication of his love for others and his calling for others is coming through us like handheld radios. So the question is, what are we actually communicating to unbelievers? Are we communicating that they need to change before we're going to show them the love of Jesus? Are we telling them they're not good enough? 
knowing full well neither are we, but Jesus gives us grace anyway? What are we doing to participate in God's calling of people to himself? Are we showing people love? Are we telling them about the gospel and inviting them to church? Or are we grumpy and surly because people don't measure up the way we want them to? Let's be the believers who participate in God's calling of people by going out and calling people to God through Jesus Christ. And then let the Holy Spirit do his thing to equip them, to fulfill them, and to sanctify them so that they fulfill their calling. By way of conclusion, Jesus calls his followers. Jesus calls his followers and he gets them ready. He prepares them and he calls them and then he helps them fulfill their calling in his strength. Jesus chooses the unlikely. There is not a person on earth who has not sinned save Jesus. So we know we're all actually unlikely to be in a relationship with God. So we can't be shocked by people who don't fit in. We can't think, nah, God can't do anything with them. Because man, the early followers of Jesus that went against all standards of what it looked like to be in a religious scene, look at them. Fishermen, hard dudes, prostitutes, people who for some reason we think can never be redeemed. Those were the people who Jesus redeemed. So pray for the unlikely. Pray for those who don't fit in. God might just be calling them to himself. And followers call other followers. God has given us the responsibility to communicate what he is calling others to do. And we need to be about that. The Great Commission wasn't just for certain gifted Christians. It is for all who follow Jesus. All of us are entrusted with this responsibility to communicate what he is like and what calling he has in their life. So tell people about Jesus and tell people what Jesus is doing in your life. All right, a couple of questions for you. Has Jesus called you? Has Jesus called you? If you don't know Jesus, Jesus is calling you this morning. He wants a relationship with you. And for those of us who already have that relationship, are we fulfilling what Jesus is calling us to do, which is make disciples? Secondly, knowing that Jesus calls unlikely people, who in the hardness of your heart have you ruled out of God's kingdom? Are there any people that you have a hard time with? You don't even want to see them come to Jesus. That's not okay. We need to be about seeing whoever. We need to be about seeing whoever come to Jesus because it is okay. We're all unlikely, but Jesus calls unlikely people. Application-wise, who are you praying for right now that they would become a follower of Jesus? If you don't have people that you're hoping would come to Jesus, go find those people. Start praying for them. Start building relationships with them because followers of Jesus call other followers. Right, we're gonna transition into to worship, or I'm sorry, to communion right now. So I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back on up. As Jesus has called you into relationship with him and and he's called you to fulfill his calling of you. He went to the cross for you. He sacrificed his body, his blood, as the payment for our sins against God. And in that calling, he's going to keep you for himself for eternity. This means we get to go be with Jesus for eternity. We get to keep Jesus for eternity. So as we take communion today, let's focus on the cost of his calling. His calling you to himself, his calling me to himself. Let's be thankful that he loves us so much that he was willing to sacrifice himself so that he could call us. He defeated sin and death on our behalf so that he could call us. And that calling is eternal.
So I'm going to invite you now to come up to, to grab communion. And if you're sitting next to somebody who has uh, a harder time uh, with ambulatory uh, movements, please grab their communion and take it back to them as well. And we're going to, as you're coming to uh, grab the communion, we're going to have the worship team play a little bit of music. As I normally do, I will give you the heads up to open the cracker first so you don't spill the juice. Okay, this is crazy. There are three crackers in mine. It's a picture of the Trinity. I am now required to take all three of these. That was not planned. That's weird. Go ahead and open the cup. For I received what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given his body, or when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We are thankful that Jesus calls us. We are thankful that you call an unlikely people, people who do not deserve your mercy and grace. And we are thankful that we get to participate in your calling of others, Lord, that we get to be a part of your mission to save. And Lord, it's all possible because Jesus, you willingly went to the cross your body broken, your blood poured out so that we can be saved, so that we can be called, so that we can be made righteous because you give us your righteousness. Lord, will you help us to remember that every day? Help us to be thankful for what it is that you have done for us, for you paying the price for our sins, for you taking the wrath of God that we deserved for our sins, for you defeating sin, and defeating death, making it possible that we can have eternal life with you and through you. Lord, help us to remember that, to be thankful for that, and help us, because of that, to be willing to go and call people to you. And Lord, will you empower us with your Holy Spirit so that those people listen? Will you be working on their hearts through your Holy Spirit to soften them, to help them to come to their realization of their need for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the glory this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. 
How worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
you for your grace to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we go, let's bless each other with the benediction from Jude 24 and 25. Please read with me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever.